It was the the twins, wasn't there? That one of them. Yeah, move on. Yeah. No. <laughs> they. Um, so that was a bizarre uh, thing. And again, I've spoken to the twins since. Um, I've had a little bit of uh, photo shoots with them, etc. I am convinced. Joe is convinced that they were paid a little bit extra to be obstinate, obnoxious, and back chatty. I take great offence at waking up a room full of men and somebody has the audacity to stand by the end of the bed with an erection. Who was it? It couldn't have been you. You can't get an erection. If it happens again, I will kick it until such time as it becomes unerect. Do you understand? Yes, Wolves! One section. I don't want him, Sergeant. Unlucky. Please. Once more. From the right number. And finish something in your life. One... Sergeant Major, how are you? I'm all right. It's a long time since I've been called that. <laughs> hey, respect where respect's due. Very kind. Was that... um? Is that hard for an ego thing? If you went when you when you're in the bad lad series, then you had to be a corporal, or is um, no, no, not really, because I've been a military training instructor all my life, um, and you know you train recruits at the level you train recruits at. But I'd actually applied for the job or for the audition as a sergeant major, and the guy reckoned I looked too young to be a sergeant major of that era um, and offered me a, a part-time corporal role, which meant I went in at weekends or on their days off. So <laughs> I, I decided, you know, all right, you know, it's a bit of exposure um, in the direction I wanted to go. So I accepted it. It then turned out that the guy who had my original place was an actor. And they wanted authentic, real soldiers. Uh, my background gave me the, the ideal qualification to do that job. Um, so they sacked the actor and gave me the job. Yeah, you guys really, you really all suited the parts well. Just, uh, did that get mentioned a lot? It did. But I think um, if you notice, I was, I was more on humour. Whereas Joe took the serious approach of, you know, got to win, got to be the best, got to, got to beat that section. Whereas mine was all on humour, especially in the first one. Um, and uh, sarcasm as well, which we didn't know at the time was exactly what they wanted. And the producer, Meredith Chambers, called us in after about four days. And he said, right, we know nothing about the military. You know nothing about TV. You do what you do, and we'll do what we do. At the moment, we've got enough for about six shows. That was in the first three, four days, because it was just constant, constant, constant. Um, it was recruit training in a 1950s style, so that, there was that little bit more abruptness to it. Um, but we weren't. We weren't really hemmed in by today's regulations, rules and such like, although we were very aware that we didn't want to do anything to bring the army into disrepute. So as long as you focused on it was 1950s national service and there's lots of theories come out of that. Um, the, you know, the painting of the grass, the painting of the curbstones, the shaking the leaves out of the tree, the painting the leaves. Um, you know, if it moves, salute it. If it doesn't, paint it. Um, I think, and you know the way that gossip travels around the military. Um, we had all these people that we'd got in national service back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, that after the war, there wasn't a lot for them to do. So you started inventing things, um, you know, just to keep them occupied for that day. What are we doing today? Go down a cookhouse and scrub all the pans. But we scrubbed them all yesterday. We'll do them again today. Go and peel potatoes. Um, go to that 
uh, sand hill, the large sand hill, fill up bags of sand and go and make another sand hill over there. That was typical stuff. Clean the coal, paint the coal. All those little mind mind playing games that, that we did with them, we were allowed to get away with. You wouldn't now. No, you're just, um, yeah, you're just reminding me a bit, <laughs> just the amount of time you end up hanging around in the military. Um, how, did you, how did you recruit these young men? Uh, so that was nothing to do with me. Um, how I found out about the auditions was quite bizarre. Um, I stood in the mess one night as a sergeant major, having a few beers, and somebody said, what are you going to do when you leave the army? Having been an instructor, I was highly, highly qualified to stand in a factory and shout tea break, lunch break, end of work. Highly qualified. But that was my only sort of thing I could see. So when they asked me what I was going to do when I left the army, rather than do the six-week bricklayers course or the six-week plumbers course or, you know, that sort of thing, I just out of the blue, I said, oh, I think I'm going to be an actor, which got a lot of laughs. Um, and then I went off and did loads of auditions. My mate rang me and said, there's a thing in the soldier magazine saying they're looking for authentic um, 1950s type instructors. I rang up, got the audition, got the job. The advertisement was going out at about between 11 at night, 2300, and 0100 in the morning on TV for uh, Lads Army. Could you hack 1950s National Service? Loads of kids applied for it. Uh, just as a, some to get on TV, some to test themselves. Um, some on the recommendations of their parents and off they went went through a psych evaluation um various things uh and then got the part um and that, that was how they got it it had to be 18 to 24 year olds the concept came around from one of the producers talking to his dad in the pub uh, long before the concept was conceived um and his dad said I bet the kids of today couldn't act national service like I did when I was a kid. And the idea went on and it burst in from there. And it was a huge success. How many series were there? There were four series over five years. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first one was what I always say, I now understand a little bit more, was supposed to be a documentary, um, a a factual documentary of could these kids hack national service basic training but it turned into a, a comedy a drama um, emotion everything that we weren't expecting but joe and i knew these things were happen and we knew the triggers to make them happen um but the tv company didn't so it, it just it just went Mm. Was what um one thing that comes across in the show, Nookie, is God, it really seemed bloody like the violence was gonna kick off sometimes. Never. I was I was just waiting for one of them lads to smack one of you guys one, and then I was wondering, oh my right. god, how how does the TV company deal, deal, deal with this? So I'll tell you the story. We had a couple of incidents, um, but I'll, I'll start with the first one. On the first day, I'm quite a sort of factual, know what's going to happen, um, and had quite a, I wouldn't say rough upbringing, but, you know, I, I can look after myself. So I went into the billet one day, um, and I said, gentlemen, over the next four weeks, you will feel the need to rush me. You will feel the need to punch me. You'll feel the need to take me down. There are 15 of you in here. I come in on my own. I never took security in on that first show. It was always me going in. Um, you are more than welcome to get angry and charge at me. But I promise you this, I will kill the first three. So 
it kind of leveled out. I did everything that I wanted to do. I wrecked the rooms. I, I messed people about. I messed with the heads. Um, I made examples of one and not of another, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the show, we were talking. And I said to the lads, one of them said, do you know, every day we wanted to just grab hold of you and throw you to the ground and give you a kick in. And I said, why didn't you? So we discussed it and remember that brief on the first day. None of us wanted to be in the first three. So that kind of set the, the, the playing field, as it were. But there was another one uh, where the production company got a little bit um, unsure because two of the lads had had a fight. Uh, quite a serious fight, uh, different sections. So uh, it was decided Joe and I would deal with it. We didn't, on this first series, we never told the production company anything we were going to do. We just went ahead and did it. Um, and they filmed it, again, we're on this factual thing, this lions and tigers documentary type thing. Um, and we got them out, we stood them in front of each other, and Joe said, right, is this done now? Yes, Corporal. And I said to my lad, are you sure? Yep, yes, Corporal, it's all over. Right, shake hands. They shook hands, walked away, and were best of mates from then on. The production company said, well, what, what are you doing? We thought you were going to charge them or, you know, beast them or whatever. And Joe quite rightly said, we're teaching these people to fight. And then when the fight, we're going to punish them. It happens. Emotions run high. You lose it for a moment. It's dealt with. And I, I thought that was quite a good analogy of, of a way to deal with it. So that was that one. Um, there was another one in the second series, which went a little bit far. I don't know if you remember, it was the head back on Cipriano. Um, and that, that was... Unfortunately, Ash was a good lad. And I've spoken to Ash since, the lad who administered said headbutt. Um, but he was thrown off. Uh, Cipriano was given the choice of bringing in solicitors and um, putting charges against him. But it, it was, if you ever watch it back on YouTube, it's quite severe. Um, I'm not saying Cipriano didn't overact. Um, but... So that was that one dealt with. But they're the two major incidents that I remember. Yes, I'm just writing this down so I can go, go and watch it on YouTube in a minute. It's the Cipriano, um, Ash, Ash, Ashley. I can't remember Ashley's second name, uh, but it's the headbutt incident. It was the, the twins, wasn't there? That one of them. Yeah, move on. Yeah. No, <laughs> they, um, so that was a bizarre uh, thing. And again, I've spoken to the twins since. Um, I've had a little bit of uh, photo shoots with them, etc. I am convinced, Joe is convinced, that they were paid a little bit extra to be obstinate, obnoxious and back chatty because people are not like that in real life when mixed in with another group. If you keep playing up and your group's going to get punished for your behaviour, you're going to calm it down. They were just too over the top. Um, you know, I've no doubt they're, they're kind of like that in real life, but there comes a stage where you say to yourself, hang on a minute, I need to calm it down. It's, it's not the way to do it. But they were constant, constant, constant. And 18 years later, 16 years later, here we are talking about them. So it got the desired result. Remember, that was the second series. It's no longer Joe and I doing what we want. There is a little bit of, of planning from the TV company of we need this at 10 o'clock, we need this at 11 o'clock. Um, it wasn't 24 hours filming anymore. Uh, they finished at sort of 10 o'clock. Um, so things had changed and the Brown twins came in um, and made life a little bit difficult for everyone. Mm. But <laughs> didn't, didn't have what it took to back it up. As, again, if you've got your pen with you, look at when Brown got thrown out of the cookhouse by um, Jeff Edwards, the staff sergeant, the promo sergeant. 
Yeah. Um, was it when I'm trying to think, think one of them's just a couple of them just started smashing stuff up, didn't they? Uh, it was the incident you're talking about is when Brown uh, wasn't getting what he wanted. So he threw his knife and fork down on the table, which Jeff Edwards then dived straight in. Um, I cleared the cookhouse because you don't want an audience. Um, Tim Dean, who was security, stepped in and we basically goosenecked him um, and then Tim took over and we got him out. Yeah, that's a bit that sticks in my mind because it's a funny thing, Nookie, isn't it? You know, that there's these young men, they obviously fancy themselves as hard nuts and probably quite a few of them are or, you know, they're not afraid to get stuck in. And yet in like a split second like that, they're fucking crying their eyes out um, because they can't, they just can't handle someone telling them what to do. It, it's that, I, mean, it, I think it's that feeling of powerlessness that, you know, you for as good as you are, when you've got three, I would say trained, hefty blokes that are restraining you, you can't get unrestrained from that. Very difficultly, very, with very great difficulty, but he wasn't in a position to do anything. So we had a couple of incidents with Brown. Um, you mentioned something I, I did, uh, and we'll get onto it later. Um, I did boot camps in prisons um, and I run my own team, I run my own company. And the amount of hardened prisoners that would sit down at night and just burst into tears because they've suddenly had a revelation of it's not all about them. They're, they're not as knowledgeable or as hard as they think they are. Um, so, you know, emotions are a strange thing and can hit you at any time. Mm. Yes. Does, does prison work for these kind of young men, Nookie, do we think? Under the current system, I, I don't believe, I don't believe it's having a great deal of effect. Um, <clears throat> I've had a couple of people uh, on Lads Army, a couple of lads who had been into prison. Uh, one of them said, I'd rather do six months in prison than one week with these two lunatics. Um, and then when I was in, when I was working in prison, I have to be careful how I phrase that, um, when I was working in prison, there were a number of lads who said, because I run three day boot camps, and they said, these three days have done more for me than the last 18 months in here. Because they start to believe in themselves. They start to understand what they're capable of. They find skills that they didn't know existed. Um, you know, the, prison's good, but you can only rehabilitate somebody that wants to be rehabilitated or is guided down that road to actually there's a better way. Um, I met a prisoner in Lincoln, an ex-prisoner. I was stood in a queue uh, with my daughter. And this guy came over to me covered in tattoos, a uh, big tall lad, one of his teeth missing. And he walked over, he said, excuse me, are you looking at Iocus? And I went, yes, mate. Wondering where this was next going to go. I had a little girl with him. He said, I just want to thank you for changing my life. And I went, you what? Three days I'd had him on a boot camp about five, six years before. Um, his mum came over, shook my hand, pre-COVID days, um, shook my hand and said, thank you. He's been a different person since he came out and talks about you constantly, or me and my team. But it was the way we administered what we did that changed his thought process. And he was now laying paving, stabs, paving slabs for a living, uh, running his own company. So, yeah, yeah there's I'm... ways and means. Uh, you know, sometimes short, sharp, shop is the way forward. But the, the government, the society's short, sharp, shock ideas are probably greatly different to mine. Yes. It's that thing, isn't it? If you get if you get the short, sharp shot, realise the error of your ways and what it's like to lose your freedom. 
if you can't catch them at that moment and give it, give an opportunity to get out of it, it that, that's, that's the way forward. It's once you get into the system, then you start to think you're a bit of an odd man because you can do bird, you know, and it just becomes your thing is you're good at doing bird. And then you're indoctrinated then, aren't you? You know, you I've, I've been onto a wing where granddad, dad and grandson are in three separate cells next to each other. I've taught young kids when I was doing um, my own thing. And one lad who was 15, his ambition in life, his immediate ambition in life was for his first sentence to be less than 18 months. He hadn't done anything wrong at that stage, mm. but that was the environment he came from. Another girl, 14, her ambition was for the father of her child to stay in touch when she became pregnant and gave birth. 14 years old. Her ambition was for the father to stay in touch. You know, the, the, it's the sad truth of what's out there at the moment. And to a degree, we're ignoring a lot of it. Anyway, back to bad lads. Yeah. Well, I think it's all very valid, Nookie. I um, I did a college placement, or is it a uni placement? Um, there's a chap called Trevor Philpot, Major Trevor. Uh, funny enough, he was the guy that gave me my, handed me my green berry at our award presentation in in the uh, in the Marines. Right. He went on and he formed an organisation called CFAR, the Centre for the Rehabilitation of Former Offenders. It, it was something like that. And um, I gave his staff my CV to apply for this placement. And, and when they read it, they were like, ah, oh, yeah, we've got a kind of different, you know, a guy here with a bit of experience, you could say. And, and it's good that they did because I went up I met these young lads on the first day. I just sat down and, and I told them my, my my life experience. And I was like literally that close to ending up in prison. Yeah. And like even that conversation and I, I, I took a few photos of my travels around the world and my military time. I had them in the palm of my hand, mate. You know, they they'd never seen anything. No one's ever, ever treated them like this. Um, it, the, the change in them was just, I mean, for people listening at home, like some of them didn't know how to have a bath. They, no one had ever taught them how you wash, they, you know. Yeah. The kids we had on Lad's Army, Bad Lad's Army, some of them had never spent a night away from home. Had never spent a night away from home. Um, you know, others were mollycoddled by the mothers. Um, some were estranged from the parents the the mix of life um and if you think about the first one which had tom wolf in it um tom wolf was a public school boy i just spoke to him um about a month ago and he's now running his own business um going out students and stuff like that but he was a little bit puzzled in the first show because he thought he was coming in to assist as an instructor, not as one of the bad lads. But even though he was a public school boy, he still had issues that he needed to deal with. And he eventually, in the last week, did a runner from the camp, climbed over the fence. Um, and then we threw him out, unfortunately. On reflection, I wouldn't have thrown him out. I'd have kept him. Um, because everybody deserves a second chance. But at that time, and Tom will tell you, he, he was a very, um, you can't tell me what to do because, you know, I'm a public school boy and I've run rugby clubs and I've done this and I've done that and I have qualifications and education, which means nothing in the billet. Mm. Going back to, to the CFAR thing, Nookie, right? Yeah. It was proven that if you put these lads through this system, rather than 80% that would go back and offend, it was like 20%, right? Significantly different. Plus, 
it was cheaper to put them through this course than it was to have them in prison, right? Like, we're, like we're talking about like millions or something. Um, and Trev had to shut it down because he couldn't get fund. The government wouldn't fund it. Right? Yeah, I I went through the same thing. Um, so I, I started up my company, which was uh, not all bad. Um, motivation through inspiration. Young kids, um, those that feel that they've got nothing to look forward to, they've got no qualifications, therefore they're going to end up in a factory. Um, they have no aspirations to what they can achieve. And started doing what we would call command tasks, but with a little bit of flair to them and reasoning behind it. And that then developed and developed. And then I the government came up with the NCS, the National Citizenship Service. And I went down there to bid for my company to run it. It costs 45,000 pound a year to keep a basic prisoner. If you start going high security or um, uh, mental health issues, you're going up to 60, 70,000 pound a year. Um, I was prepared to run these courses and outsource. Government weren't interested and took it to the Shakespeare, um, no, no, Shaftesbury, Shaftesbury Company or, or some, some big company that outsourced to schools and everything else, for which a lot of them were coming to me saying, can you um, bring your, your candidates to us so that they can go on to this National Citizenship Service? Um, so it kind of, they used a lot of my ideas, which I'd taken to them, uh, which weren't unique or anything else. It was just somebody had the same idea. Um, but that was it. And it's what you're talking about as well. The government is saying, oh, we haven't got the money for this. And we're getting political now. But they, they can't see that that, give, give me five million pounds and I will sort out 60% of the youth around the country because I've got the resources to do that in the manner that we do it. Um, and while we don't want to get onto this subject, it's the same as COVID. Close the borders now, close everything. Let's have a short, sharp shock and let's see where we're at the end of it. Instead of all this fiddling about of that count is on lockdown, this count is on lockdown, that border's open. You can go out if you've got shopping to do, you can, et cetera. It's just that there are no rules to it. And it's all finance based, in my opinion. Nookie, what I'm going to do, I wrote down some kind of questions that I think people would be interested, well, I, I certainly would be interested in them about the series. Yeah. But then let's come on and chat about your story, because I know you've had a, you haven't had the easiest of, um, you know, lives. I believe everything you read on Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. Although, uh, although it's actually all true. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get a wicked did you did, did you no, have someone no my daughter came in one day and she said have you seen your wikipedia page i said i haven't got one and she went yeah you have um so i looked at it and whoever's put it together and i i'm not technically minded um whoever's put it together has basically over the last 20 years taken little snippets from newspapers radio interviews, TV interviews, and built a picture with them. I mean, it's not wrong what it says. There's some of it I wouldn't have put in there, but it, it's all pretty factual. Yeah, so that's good. Some, somebody's done quite a good job, but they, they could have based it a lot better. They made me look a bit better. They never mentioned I've done 30 TV shows in the time. What, what were they? 30, you want me to reel off 30 right now? What, 30 different TV shows? Yeah, but it, it was, um, so I did Trisha Goddard for three years. I was her sergeant major for boot camps. Um, I did Danger in Coming Attack with Nick Frost twice. I've done the Ant and Deck show twice. Um, I banged up with Beadle when he was around, when he was on a, an island thing. Um, I did a, oh, you've got me thinking now. Oh, I used to do a thing called Cruel Summer um, and Cruel Winter, which was a, it was like a lad's army thing, taking a load of kids back to school and just beasting them. Um, so I had a bit of a, an appearance in that. 
Um, I've done all your sort of Good Morning TV, um, Good Morning Britain, that that sort of thing. So they they all add up. Um, something about Miriam. I don't know if you recall that show. I don't really. I haven't watched um, mainstream TV since. Um, well, well there's, there's something about Miriam was quite interesting because it was six guys. One of them being an ex Royal Marine, actually. Um, Dom. I can't remember his second name. He got taken out by a grenade in uh, in Iraq on his leg, um, but he, he was a good lad. Um, and it was six guys, good looking guys, wooing the affection of a Mexican model. And the winner won 10 grand and two week holiday on a yacht out in the, wherever it was. Um, and at the end, the girl Miriam turned out to be a bloke. <laughs> Just have a look at it. On, she's killed herself now. I mean, oh. commit suicide. Um, well, was that was it intentional that she was a bloke, or did she just not tell, or he or she uh, did not tell anyone? No, all the producers knew, uh, and the all the start. The only people that didn't know were the six lads that were trying uh, to got it. Trying to get a date with her. God, uh, again, it's YouTube available. The trouble is, you shouldn't fuck around with shit like that these days, should you? You know, and it, it well, this was the whole thing. Once they produced it. Uh, these lads at the end, one of the dads was a solicitor, um, got on a plane, came home, and then started to sue, um, try to think of Endemol, to sue Endemol for mental torture and you know everything else. And the production of it was held for six months before they allowed it on air. But they allowed it on air. Uh, it went to court and everything. And a, a lot of controversy to it. Yeah, it's just that old school mentality in it of like humiliating people that are different and and yeah, d different when you're in Thailand, isn't it? Nobody yeah. knows about that. Yes. Gosh, mate, I'll tell you what. No, they, don't, don't. They, there's some stories I will take them to the grave, and I'm <laughs> and I got no no issues with that. Yeah, you know. right. You know, no issues with that, but yeah. <laughs> yes, live and let live is what I say. Um, right, just some questions. The lad who had the malfunction parachuting. Yeah. Was that genuine or did he just... It was, it was genuine. Um, so out of the, well, I say 30, we finished with about 18, 17. Only six of them could jump. Uh, I think that was budgetary um, needs. So only six of them could jump. So we selected the six that could go. And after when all the lads were there watching, um, we saw this guy come out. And it was Joe that spotted that his shoot wasn't open. And Jim Bush as well, Jim was there. So they're both ex-paras. Um, and I could see the look on Joe's face. His shoot hasn't opened. And he seemed to be a bit lifeless as well. Um, so what one of the cameramen was like, oh my god, and got his camera on it. A couple of the directors, you could hear them fart in Belgium. Um, it was a scary moment, but then we saw the lad cut away his shoot and pull his reserve. Uh, you'll know yourself the chances of that happening are, are one in whatever the number is. Um, so while it looks dramatic for TV, it really wasn't. We we wouldn't have... And the, the guy was... There was a guy on there that was a um, skydiver. Um, he, he actually did that for... Not for a living, uh, but it wasn't him that had the malfunction. Um, and he's died, in, incidentally, um, the, the skydiver. He came in too low to open his chute at a display uh, and just creamed in on it. So he passed away. But in answer to your question, that was not fixed. That was a genuine malfunction. No. And a very, very scary moment for all of us. Yeah, my heart was in my mouth. When, when the shoot was coming down and they were filming the, sh the, the shoot that he just um, cut away from. Yeah. Um, 
you couldn't tell watching it on telly whether that was him wrapped up in the shoot. And anyone who skydived will know that is game over. You even and that, yeah. You can't. That even... was what we thought as well. I mean, yeah. I, I wasn't that worried because it was one of Joe's blokes, not one of mine. <laughs> yeah, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, this is like silly boy's own shit now, and um, but. How much shit did you get from veterans? Um, uh, very little, very little. Do you I, mean the 1950s veterans? No, I was thinking in particular, how many paras said these lads don't deserve to wear the red, the red berry, you know, the cherry berry? Uh, I've, had, I've had one that confronted me and that was in the... Um, in the Trafalgar in Aldershot, the Traff pub. Uh, there was a load of us in there. Uh, I was being a bit of an arse anyway, but um, he started on it. And half a dozen lads stood behind and went, mate, it's a TV show. Get over it. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, I, I get the, the friendly banter ribbing. Um, but if I, or when I did go out doing appearances in uniform, I rarely wore the red berry. Um, it's a TV show. So, no. Mm. I never wore the para badge. No. Um, did any of them, like, go back? I, I'm, I'm guessing quite a few went back to offending because that's just the nature of change. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Now, I stay in touch with a lot of the lads from Series 1 and Series 2 and a couple from series four, none from series one, uh, series three, sorry. Um, no, they've gone on, I, I'll give you success stories for a lot of them. Um, one from the first show went on to be a pilot for British Airways. A um, couple of them set up their own businesses from the second show. Uh, one is a school teacher, one is a professor in a college. Um, there's, there's loads of stories I can tell, but on the whole, they're doing all right. Or is that the ones that I stay in touch with? Because I haven't heard from the Browns since I left the show. So I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. What, what a great success story. Well, Z Zedakis springs to mind. He sails boats around the world delivering them for millionaires. Mm. So he's like a ship's captain. Oh, uh, good effort, boys. Cipriano, I think, is probably still coming down off some high from something. <laughs> what about um, what about the emotions? Because um, when you watch these boys pass out and all their parents are there, I mean, that's an emotional thing for a service person anyway, who's just, you know, who's just passed out of training. But these lads were kind of written off by society, weren't they? I mean, a lot of it for their own. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're, they're a product of their environments. It's not like their own doing, but. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say written off. You know, they had issues that they had to deal with. Um, but for the likes of Joe and I, um, we saw our creation come to fruition mm. and the uh adulation that the the kids gave to us and the thanks that their parents gave to us um i've got one lad who lives in london i went to his wedding um in fact i've been most of the lads weddings but i went to his wedding and his dad came over to me his dad's a very proud man and he said nookie we have you to thank for this peter was i've just mentioned his name <laughs> he was off the rails and he's really come through since doing that show and you've always been there for him since, which I have for a lot of the lads. So uh, the emotions, you know, they start on day one where they're peeing on the back of the truck and they're drinking beer and they're all hard men until they get off the truck and suddenly there's a little bloke and a big bloke screaming in their faces, showing no fear whatsoever, um, and then just moulding them into the people that they can be. Um, and I, I say that showing fear. The moment you show fear or any sort of uncertainty to 15 blokes that you're trying to train, they'll be on you. They'll be all over you. So you can't. 
however false or, or real it is, you cannot show any sort of weakness or fear to them. And the, the classic, you talk about emotion, the classic is the mail delivery. After a week, which to them seems like a month, they suddenly get their first lot of mail. You always get one that hasn't received any mail. They've got no emails, they've got no phones, they've got no contact with the outside world. And suddenly mum's written to them, telling them how much they love them and miss them. That's going to get its own emotion, which we knew it would. Yeah, I can't be dealing with that. Sh it's the same on these celebrity programmes, isn't it? But it, yeah, it is. And I, I don't watch them or I tend not to watch them. But the emotions are real. They're not made up. Um, yeah. I remember one in the first series where one of the lads read the lad's letter to him because he was crying through his eyes. Um, and, you know, it was mum misses you and the dog misses you. And, and this lad was beside himself with tears. Um, and you're like, yeah, that's real emotion. And the, the lad who, you know, for the second, third week still hasn't got any mail from anyone. Um, I don't know, I think it was a second series. I wrote a letter to one of the lads because I knew he wasn't getting any mail, just so that he got a letter. Now, I won't tell you what was in it, but it, it finished off with buck your ideas out. <laughs> but he got a letter. What happened to the... Um... To odd job then. What was this? Was he was he St Stimson or something? Stimson, um, fourth series. Uh, he was one of Cho's. Very comical Welsh lad. Um, he did join me on Facebook at one stage, but he was just bone idle. Um, and no concept of life or or what was expected of him. Uh, his job was to produce children with a woman and then watch it grow. That was it. Mm. He, he looked like he wasn't long for this world with that amount of weight that he was carrying. It, it looked... I, I, I reckon he was Wales's worst export. Yeah. I'll tell you what, he's Wales's funniest export, though. Me and my little boy were watching it yesterday. I, I, I probably shouldn't, but I was, I was laughing my ass off at everything he did. It was. I, I think there's an element of he plays the or he played the fool, to disguise his inability to do certain things. So there was a bit of an act on there, and by the comedy, it takes it away from his size and his lack of ability, in my opinion. By in a. By inability to do certain things, do you mean like everything except eating? Yeah. <laughs> you know, walk, talk, <coughs> interact, help, assist, etc. <laughs> Nookie, you <coughs> excuse me. Um you grew up in Lincolnshire. Shh. Uh, shh. <laughs> Yeah, I did. It's very flat up there. It's good for um, building uh, aerodromes, is it not? Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a lot of them around here. Yeah, it it, it it's interesting that because I've lived a bit in uh, Louth, Sleaford. All right. Yeah, we're near Sleaford. Not um. I, I don't want to say not good memories for me, but basically every time my parents separated, we'd go from the south of England, 300 miles up north, and we'd end up going to some random school in, um, yeah, like Sleaford or Louth and living, yeah. um, living in another, you know, place and all that. Um, so I probably didn't have the best experience up there, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a it's a beautiful part of the country, isn't it? it? Well, it is in parts. And, you know, we, we live in a small, well, I say small village. We live in a village. Uh, we moved from another village in Lincolnshire where it seemed that everybody knew everybody and everybody knew everybody's business. And I wasn't that comfortable there. Now we're in this other place. We're out in the countryside. So even in the current climate, 
we don't really see a lot of it. it it's kind of, you know, it's happening out there, but not within our environment. Mm. Uh, of course, it is happening in our environment, but we're that spread out from 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 others. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I was brought up in Grantham, uh, local council estate. Uh, we ran riot. We did what we want. We nicked off the milkman. Um, we took the uh, Corona. Oh, back. What are you doing? Where have you gone? Sorry, one second. Bear with us, folks. Mate, one job you had. One uh, job. Oh, and we're back. Sorry, mate, over to you. So we, we did the nicking the empty bottles off the Corona wagon and then taking them back to him to get the sixpence back, earning money that way. Um, and I, I was talking the other day, I had a milk round that I used to start at half four in the morning, then a paper round, which I used to start about half six, quarter seven, and then go to school on the occasions that I went. Um, and, and then that'd be my day until Saturday and I had a Saturday job. So I, I've kind of always worked, I think. Um, but then I was going down the wrong track. I was getting into a lot of fights. I was getting known by the police. I tried to join the army several times. Um, Ended up leaving home when I was about 15, living in a garage, uh, you know, like a sort of council garage type thing. And I mean, like an SO garage where there's a shop on tap. Um, <laughs> and then for a bizarre reason, I jumped on my moped from Grantham and rode up to Manchester where my friend's brothers lived um, and was hitchhiking into Manchester, which was about 15 miles away from where I was staying. And a traveler picked me up and he said, I've got a place you can live and a job. So I ended up there for about six months. Um, then moved down to Nottingham, got a great job, but I was only 17 and a half then. Can we, um, can we go back to the traveler thing? Because that, that fascinates me. Um... Why do you like dogs? Do you like dogs? Say again. Do you like dogs? <laughs> I can't understand you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a quote from Snatch. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. When I think of Snatch, I just think of him standing up behind a caravan and pulling his pants back up. <laughs> yeah. Brad, Brad Pitt. That's it. But anyway, go on. Well, so if, I was going into Manchester and walking into shops, asking if there were any jobs. Bearing in mind, I'm a 16 and a half year old, scruffy little kid, probably quite dirty as well. Uh, staying at my friend's brother's house or friend's mother's house, which was a big place. They lived behind um, uh, somebody, Gordon, some football player, Manchester United football player. So it's a big house. So I was going into shops and asking if there were any jobs. Yeah, we've got a job, where do you live? Well, I haven't got anywhere to live. So I was going around bed and breakfast and places, rooms to let and that. Where do you work? Well, I haven't got a job. I've got to get somewhere to live. So I was in that catch 22. I couldn't get a job unless I had somewhere to live and I couldn't get somewhere to live unless I had a job. I was hitchhiking back one day. An old boy picked me up in a Land Rover, him and his mate. And I told him the story I've just told you. And he said, well, I've got a place you can live, boy, and, and I'll get you a job. Pulled into this uh, traveller's site in uh, Partington, near, near Lim. Um, and he, he went, there you go, five pound a week for this two, two bed caravan. Um, and I went, well, I haven't got a job yet. And he, he was like, Johnny, come here, give this boy a job, five pound a day, seven days a week, whether he works them or not. And I was like, wow, yeah, okay, boss, okay. So we were traveling all over the country, picking up engines from scrapyards, delivering them to a factory in Manchester. This guy was walking out with wads, wads of cash, and then would just throw me a fiver. Um, when we were traveling around the country, we would stay in hotels um, and then get back to the site. And then I think I got about seven or eight weeks behind on my rent which he never asked for, ever. Um, and then I just did a moonlight flip one night. Just left. 
But I did go back several years later when I was in the army. Um, and I went on the site and everybody was looking at me a bit cautiously, you know, who's this bloke? Because I was a bit smarter then. And um, the old boy came out and he went, young Richard. And I was like, do you remember me? He said, yeah, yeah, I remember you. Which, and to be honest, it, it wasn't long before the time you read about all the travellers taking people and using them as slaves and everything else. Um, so I kind of analysed that. This guy gave a young kid a break with no ulterior motive. He, he had no, no agenda. It was just a kind thing to do. Even when he was 40 quid behind on his rent, didn't bother me. He didn't knock on the door and go, where's your bloody money? And he knew I was getting 35 quid a week. I think he was just helping a young kid. Mm. So, good on him. Yeah, incredible. I tried to give him the money back, but he wouldn't take it. Did you give him the interest? No. <laughs> no. And um, so, Royal Army Ordnance Corps, that's uh, it. Yeah, what makes somebody join? that or were you desperation so i had a cousin who was in the artillery all i knew that my cousin was in the artillery and i didn't want to go in the artillery because they must all be like him i had a cousin who was in the medics who in three years had traveled all over the world and then you had me who couldn't get into the army uh, because i was known by the police etc known by the police not police record um, and my school attendance record was like two days a week so when I went into the careers office um, on this random day it's look I've tried several times before I can't get in he put me through the test sit down next thing I know I'm on my way to Sutton Coalfield um, and I got four sheets of paper I don't know if you remember the sheets of paper you used to get back in the day uh, a lot of people had one sheet of paper. I wanted to go in the RCT. I wanted to drive trucks. I wanted to be that guy driving down the A1 waving at me, which is what we used to do at the side of the A1. Uh, and apparently there were no vacancies left in the RCT, but there was one. Well, there were several signals, um, artillery, uh, various others. Um, which I didn't want to go in the artillery and the signals I thought was a bit too intelligent for me at the time. And then he said, we've got, we've got, we might have a vacancy in the RO, a RAO, whatever it was he called it, because I had never heard of it. Um, and the major very kindly got on the phone in his office whilst I was sat there. And he said, I've got a young individual in front of me who is keen to be a driver yeah all right just a minute and he looked at me and said they've got one vacancy left they're happy to give it to you if you want it oh hang on nikki all right sorry continue he very kindly uh rang this guy who said there was only one vacancy left in the whole of the reoc for a driver so i took it um, as it turns out, I've never looked back, but I wasn't aware of what it was. Um, you know, then you start getting called blanket stacker um, and all sorts of various names. So I started off as a driver. Then I became OC's driver, radio operator, uh, class one. And so then I was the unit class one radio operator. Then I became CO's driver. Then I became PT or Akai, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And from that, in an early stage, 1984, I did the military training instructors course, which I passed. Um, and I've never looked back. Never looked back. Made me the man I am. Mm. Uh, and now, you know, I'm a military training instructor, retired. Yeah, that's the thing. Even if you don't get in the military, it's... Yeah. You, no regrets. Don't look back. It's absolutely no. it doesn't serve any purpose except to fuck your one life over. But um, the, the great thing about the REOC, the military training instructors, 
was it was a new trait. Well, it wasn't a new trait. It used to be RD, regimental duties. Um, but they brought people in from other corps. So we had Marines. Um, we had um, infantry, King's Own Scottish Borderers, um, Queens, uh, engineers, uh, Scottish Regiment. It was just everything. It was a whole... And you put all them together, you've got a great instructional crew that can teach anything from anywhere. Um, you know, the qualifications that came with them uh, left you in awe, in envy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was it. And then it became the really, the really, really, I can't say it. 1994, it amalgamated and became the really, Okay. The really, yeah. Really, if anyone listen, all this allegiance that we have to our core or our whatever, it, just remember the government don't give a shit about any of that. They'll, you know, they'll put the Marines and the Paris together without even thinking about it. And, uh, you know, which is good because then you could parachute onto ships. <laughs> it's good because yeah. <laughs> I was going to say you could have a punch up every day. <laughs> or you could throw each other out the portholes into the sea. <laughs> Um, Kosovo, wasn't it? You were in Kosovo. That sounds a bit, um, yeah. We, we went in on the first day of the ceasefire. Um, so a couple of my mates, um, who were pathfinders went in over the mountains to go in and clear the route. We drove up, um, but as we were driving in, so we were based in Macedonia. As we were driving in, they were driving out um, and we got set up and General Jackson was uh, on our camp. And I remember uh, we were stood by the wire fence one morning. This was about three days in, watching all the Serbs leaving. And he said to his aide-de-camp, my God, if I'd have known they had this much armour, I wouldn't have come in so soon. So three days later, it was still moving out because they'd hidden in the mountains and the hills and such like. They had a lot more than we realised. But I'm guessing our air power was greater than theirs and we, we just annihilated them. Um, they realised they couldn't, couldn't win. Mm. So, Did you see so, much in the way of atrocities or, or the evidence of all that? Stuff? Uh, yeah, the evidence, uh, which we saw in Bosnia as well, uh, where you've got a beautiful village just absolutely decimated. And you you can see what it used to be. Um, and even the ones that are still running. Um, it, yeah, you, you can see the devastation. And then there were guys that were clearing houses and such like. I remember one family went back to the house and the little kid ran up the driveway or the, the pathway uh, to the front door ahead of the family. And there was a landmine there. And he hit the landmine. Um, there was another story. One of our guys was driving back in Bosnia and saw three armed men dragging somebody out of a house um, and shoot them. Um, we said, why the hell didn't you stop? And quite rightly said, and what, what exactly was I going to do? Um, so, yeah, the, the atrocities were there. The... Um, the wood factory that we moved into in Bosnia had uh, a bath, a stone bath, uh, as big as a building type thing down the end. Um, and allegedly there was a lot of atrocities um, forced to march into that bath full of acid. Um, stories like that, whether true or not, they play on your mind for a long time. Mm. Uh, but you know these things went on. There was a guy that worked for me. He'd been given the house next door because his, I think it was a Muslim family, said, look, we've got to leave, we've got to go. And he just gave him the house. Um, so he had a, a massive, great mansion sort of thing, free of charge. Uh, we built a school out, or we rebuilt a school out in Bosnia just through... Uh, you know, getting the right wood and getting the right materials and, and building this school back up. So when we arrived, and I'm going Bosnia, when we arrived in Bosnia, there was about 300 people in the village. When we left, there was about 3,000. 
Wow. So, yeah, we, we saw a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, and Kosovo, yeah, there was, there was definite evidence. The one that sticks in my mind was um, uh, Sarajevo. We had occasion to drive up to Sarajevo a couple of times, and that was just incredible. High-rise flats with, you can see the, 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 the town was functioning, but it was devastated at the same time. Mm. There, there were bullet holes, uh, and I mean large, large bullet holes. Where's my camera? There. Large bullet holes in the side of buildings and people living underneath them in, in the high-rise flats mm. or living above them. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I remember uh, an engineer when we arrived in theatre and he gave us the brief and he said, remember, this is a beautiful country. The scenery is beautiful, but, and excuse my language, but the country is fucked forever because there were just landmines scattered everywhere. And you'd be driving down the road and they'd wash up after a rainy day on the side of the road. And you go, oh, landmine. Yeah, they just became second nature. So, yeah, um, it, it, the dev devastation, you can see it. Did you um, suffer with anything after witnessing all this stuff? Did you ever have any kind of dodgy moments or? Yeah, I went into a bar one night and it was packed and I couldn't get to the front. So I had to get my mate to order the beer. That's not what you meant, is it? <laughs> well, um, no. And uh, um, not that I'm stronger than anybody else. Um, it, it's a job. It's a job. And, uh, you know, my, my encounter of various things hasn't been as traumatic as other people. Mm. But as a military training instructor, um, and you teach battle shock, and you, you teach uh, field craft, you, you teach tactics. So you, you start to become sort of, you know, and this is the way to deal with it, and this is the way to deal with it. Um, and I think if you, in your own mind, you treat it as a job, it, it's easy to say, there are people out there that are suffering, and I know, and I know people that suffer. Um, but, you know, I, I will help in any way that I can. But no, in answer to your question, not really. Other than the wrench of leaving the army, I think that hit me harder um, than I realised and and the ability to settle into Civvy Street which I don't think I did very well No Did, did you find yourself drinking more? That would be a very hard challenge <laughs> since last <laughs> <laughs> since last March yeah I have been um, No, because I, I think I drank a lot in the army anyway but I was your typical um, I'll go out at night and drink till three in the morning and then be out running at six in the morning with the squad and giving a good show. So one of those naturally fit guys that didn't suffer hangovers, you know, the one you hate, that bloke. Um, so I, I've always been quite fit um, and always done the job that I've got to do. Rarely do I go, oh, I can't move or, or I was drinking last night. Um, I just get a, a night... If I've got a job to do, I'll go and do the job. But if that job's over and I fancy a beer, I'll have a beer. Yeah, got so, you. No, I don't, I don't think I did drink more. Um, certainly when I was in TV, I was socialising more. Is that what alcoholics say? I was just socialising. <laughs> oh, yes. When you've got issues around alcohol, mate, you'll, 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 you'll say anything. It's called maintenance. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can take it or leave it. I prefer to take it, but depending on what's going on. Good. Yes. Uh, we didn't talk about the milling, did we? How was it the milling for these? Do you want to explain to our friends at home what, what milling is and why it's important from a you know military perspective? Uh, well, is it is it important from a military perspective? So milling is, um, let me layman's terms it, is untrained boxing. So let's imagine you've got all your hard men who join the army and suddenly 
it's one on one and more or less equal partner and you just have to punch each other as best you can um now some will fight back some will cower some will turn the back but it is just punch 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 and it'll only go on for about 10 15 seconds it seems like 10 to 15 hours um but it's just to to show that aggression to be able to to handle that fear of getting punched in the face um fortunately for me i was over that fear by about the time i was 18 um but yeah millen is is unorthodox boxing were there any surprises then on the on the sh on the sh on the show uh no because I, I think when you can read people and i don't mean that as an analyst or anything uh, you know who's going to do well you know who isn't uh, Jody Copeland springs to mind, who looked like a startled rabbit when you put the headgear on him. He was just sort of... And out he went and gave it his best shot. Um, Mark Pittman, who won't mind me saying, Mark Pittman? Ross, sorry, Ross Pittman. Ross Pittman, who was the gay lad on the, um, the first series. If you watch him, um, he's just sort of, Oh, oh, stop, stop, stop. Whereas everybody else is at least trying to fight back. Um, I lost uh, Nicky Sand Sand Sanderson. I lost Nicky Sanderson, who was a top boxer. Um, we would have won that competition had we have had him. And everybody was a bit afraid of him. Plus, I'd have had him training my lads. Um, so... No, there were no surprises from the sparring, uh, sorry, the milling, sparring or the boxing. Mm. Not for me anyway. Was that a good, you look like you're enjoying yourself watching the milling? Uh, I enjoy watching boxing far more than I enjoy doing it. <laughs> Especially when my team are in there and they're doing well. Mm. Did the lads get alcohol on the show? I saw them having a drink in the naffy. I, I couldn't tell what, what they were supposed there to were, do. There were two nights. There was halfway through, we gave them a crate between the section. And then on the last night, we just all got well, well over it. What, but it otherwise, any... otherwise, no. There was no sneaking of alcohol. Um, the, they lived and lived and breathed lads army. Mm. No, they weren't smoking a wacky backy then, no? No, they never saw us out of uniform. They never had access to the outside world. Uh, they never had TVs, newspapers or anything. Bearing in mind, it was filmed uh, twice, I think, during the World Cup. Um, so they weren't seeing the results or anything. They were asking people when they saw them on the training area. And, but we tried to keep it as real as we could. Mm. So they never saw us out of uniform. So, Nuki, tell us about your company now, then, Not All Bad. And, and how can people get hold of you? What services can you offer? They can't. I've had enough of it. Um, so, uh, so, in its day, it started off as motivational training for disengaged, disadvantaged youth. It then moved on to um, prisons, HM, uh, HMPs and young offenders. Um, and then local authorities throughout the country. So I'd turn up for a day and do a day's motivational training, running command tasks um, with, a, with a scripted sort of um, layout of it. I had a team of guys that worked with me um, and we did various hard to reach individuals. Um, we then turned it into a social enterprise, uh, still running the, the boot camps for local authorities and taking over a local youth club in Bourne and Grantham and running them. Um, and then it, it sort of devolved. Um, and certainly since COVID, uh, it, it's just, it's not too difficult to run, but it's too time consuming and uh, not, not greatly beneficial. I will still do the odd appearance or if somebody's got a problem with one of their kids and they call me, I'll go in and deal with it as best I can for them. 
Um, so I'm still out there keeping my hand in mm. uh, and still doing the odd motivational after dinner chat, except nobody's having dinners anymore. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, I'm there if I'm needed. Yeah, good man. What is there a, like, are you on LinkedIn or anything? Is it, what's the, if someone wanted to get hold of you tomorrow to book one of your services, where, how would they get hold of you? Uh, so I, I've got a website, which is www.notallbad.co.uk, which at the moment uh, is down. We're, we're considering putting it back up, but um, info at notallbad.co.uk will get an email to me. Ah, uh, got you. Okay. Or Instagram. Which is or Instagram. Yeah, I don't quite know how Instagram works. My daughter set it up for me, and I know I should be more active, but I throw the odd photograph on or the odd comment and, and then just see the responses that come from it. So, yeah, I think it's Nuki Niokas at Instagram, isn't it? Something like that. And on that point, we mustn't forget to thank Lewis... Uh, Lewis Noons is one of the uh, youngsters on my team. Very nice young man. Um, and it was us, it was him that put us in touch and wanted you to come on the show. So, Lou. It was, yes. Yeah. He's Lewis, thank you very much. Well done. Yeah, he's an absolute legend. So, thank you, mate. Um, wow. Nookie, that just leaves me to say massive thank you, mate, for coming on the show. I'm, I'm absolutely honoured that you've been on. Um, get to meet that, you know, you get to meet the legends doing this job and uh, of which you are most definitely um, one of them. I think you pronounced leg end wrong then. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so, Chris. Yes, yes, no, it's just wonderful. And uh, what a great... For anyone watching, if you've not seen Bad Lads Army, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but it is all on YouTube um, and it is definitely, definitely worth a watch. Um, stay on the line, Nuki, so I can thank you properly. To all our friends at home, could you like and subscribe? If you have any questions or anything, put them in the comments. Uh, look after yourselves and we'll see you next time.